We've talked a lot about organization of a document, but what does organization really mean? What are the things we should be looking for? There are several, and in this video we're going to look at only a few. In subsequent videos, we'll look at a couple more. The first is that the ideas in a document must flow logically. The reader shouldn't be jumping around from one concept to another. Instead, it should take the reader through the document from what they need to know in the beginning to the final conclusions. Obvious places to find required information include things like appendices and where the main body goes. We're going to be focusing on that in a different video. We will, however, talk about appendices here because often it's not clear what goes in an appendix and what doesn't. Finally, I'll briefly touch on the idea of table of contents, figures, and tables. In subsequent videos, I'll show you how to make these and when. The logical flow of ideas is probably the most important part of a document. If your document jumps around, for example, if it starts talking about one technology, then another, and then a third before finally coming back to the first, the reader might be confused and not able to follow your argument. Since a lot of technical communication is all about convincing someone via argumentation, having an unsound or illogical argument is automatically going to not convince that person that they should follow what you're recommending. The idea is to start from the beginning and don't jump ahead or jump around. And usually what you do is prevent evidence before conclusions. That is to say, you shouldn't make a conclusion and then provide supporting evidence. There is one exception to this rule, and that's when you're writing an executive summary, or something for someone who won't be necessarily reading the entire set of evidence you're providing. At that point, you should make it very clear what the conclusion is in case the person doesn't have the time to read the rest of the report. Usually, though, you'll know exactly when that's appropriate and when it isn't because of the guidelines on the report. I'm going to show you two examples from a report. The idea behind this report is to recommend a model of robot to purchase and a factory floor layout. I'm only going to show you one paragraph from this report. The first example is going to be poorly organized. The second example is going to be more logically organized. Here's the poorly organized example. Note that the formatting is very non-standard and you normally wouldn't put it like this in the report. What I've done instead is underline things that relate to the factory's environment. For example, we can put it into the blast furnace area, it relates to the factory. And I've bolded things that relate to the robot. As you can see, I have factory following a robot fact, following a factory following robots, following a conclusion that appears to have something to do with what we should purchase, except that my actual big conclusion, how much will it cost, is the very first thing. The system will cost $1 million. If you read this example, for example, pause the video and take a look, there's nothing necessarily wrong with it. All of the information is still there. But because it jumps around, the, you, the reader is going to have a lot of difficulty following a particular argument. Let's see what this looks like when it's reworked. The first thing I've done was I've added a little bit of an introduction to this paragraph, explaining what I'm looking for. Again, I'm using the same formatting, but realistically, you would never use this type of formatting in a report. I've then organized it so that the talk about the environment and the talk about the robot follows the same order that I've introduced it in. I said that I'm going to explain things about the environment and also about the model of the robot in that order. And then my paragraph follows that order. This is all about the environment and this is all about the robot. Notice that my conclusion is at the very end. From this, we've determined the system will cost $1 million. In the previous example, it was at the very beginning. I've built my argument, explaining what we need to consider, why, and then finally my conclusion. Now realistically, in such a document, you'd probably give a lot more information for why the factory needs to spend a million dollars. But the key is that the argument is now organized, things that should go together go together, and the argument is built up. Like I said, sometimes you wouldn't put the entire argument or all of your evidence into a single part of the body. This is because the person reading it might not have the time or even the expertise to read it, but someone will one day. In order to handle this case, you put them in an appendix. This is used for supporting material, but what's important is that that supporting material is not relevant to the main purpose of the report. 
That is, if I don't read the appendix and I trust you 100%, I should still be able to do what you recommend. In our above example, the executive who's making this decision might just want to know how much will it cost. It then makes sense to put a thorough cost analysis, which that executive may not read, but perhaps an assistant will, or an engineer, into an appendix. It might explain how much each individual robot costs, how many we need, where they should go in the factory, why, how much it costs for the additional thermal protection, and so on, eventually getting to our $1 million figure. What's key is that you do not put important action items or claims into the appendix. Appendices are meant to not be read unless they need to be. The idea is that if I read the entire body of the report, I should have all of the main important conclusions. I might just be missing some of the supporting evidence. If I see a conclusion that I don't necessarily agree with, I'll go to the appendix and read the evidence. It's also important to note that some things that might go into an appendix in one report might be the body of another. As an example, if I'm talking about the robot, the Fanuc LR Mate 200 IC, Maybe I'll put the manual for that robot, or perhaps some CAD drawings, into the appendix. Again, the executive doesn't need to know this, but someone reading this report, for instance, to now understand how to start implementing this procedure, will have to have a good understanding of where they can find this information, and the appendix is a great place for that. As you're writing a report, you'll be using figures and tables. Figures and tables are always introduced in the text before they appear, unless formatting issues prevent this. What that practically means is if you have a very large figure or a very large table that can't fit on the same page as the introducing text, it might have to go before or after, and that's okay. Whenever possible, though, you should introduce the figure or the table and then show the figure in the table. Good sentences to use might say, in figure one below, the robot's workspace is shown or the testing procedure is shown in Table 1. These sentences don't need to be complex, but they should introduce what we're about to see in the table. This is especially important if there's further explanation in a next paragraph. For example, the testing procedure is shown in Table 1 might be followed by a large description of why testing is important in this case, and then the table will show up. The reader will understand that a table is coming and we'll look for it either right now before coming back to the report or after reading the rest of the paragraph. But without that introduction, it will read as though the table is just popping into existence in the middle of the report and there'll be no context for what they're looking at. Sometimes you need tables of contents, figures, and tables. This is usually at the beginning of a longer document and by far the most common is just the table of contents. Whenever you have multiple sections, you need a table of contents. This might be a little bit different from your expectation. For example, if I have a two-page report, do I really need a table of contents? I would argue that if you have a two-page report, you may not need different sections. But whenever you do have different sections and multiple pages, you'll need a table of contents so that the person who's reading this report will be able to find the information they need quickly. A table of figures, or a table of tables, it's usually for much longer and much more formal reports. If I'm writing, say, a 30 to 40 page report, it might have upwards of 20 figures in it. It's important to be able to find those figures very quickly. This is especially important when I'm writing, for example, a manual. Manuals might exceed hundreds upon hundreds of pages. Being able to find that one figure that explains the timing of the system or the physical geometry of the system without having to leaf through 600 pages of irrelevance is very important. But for the most part, if you're only writing a two to five page report, it's unlikely you're going to be using a table of figures. 